Um, I know we're all concerned about traffic, but I do have another issue. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I believe that uh, as a member of the Board of Supervisors, you voted against corn, civic openness and negotiations. And that turned out to be a better decision than we anticipated at the time because Governor Brown just signed a bill which people have been referring to as the anti-coin coin, um, where if uh, a local government adopts an ordinance that requires coin, it comes along with a whole bunch of other requirements that would just sink them. Um, so they, you know, it's an effective discouragement for adopting coin as an ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean you can't actually use coin. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when the negotiations come up, you can publicize um, the proposed agreement and, and let people in the community know. Uh, what I'd like to know is what is your view, why, uh, well, why did you oppose COIN and what is your view of how or whether uh, something like that ought to be used? Okay, good question. So for those who aren't familiar, COIN is Civic Openness in Negotiations, a coin. Um, and actually, I didn't oppose coin. I was actually supportive of a couple of the elements proposed in coin. Coin was looking at how can uh, negotiations between government agencies and labor, which all public agencies go through, become more open to the public, uh, transparent, uh, provide better, if not, if, if the public not invited into the negotiation itself by actually airing publicly every proposal that goes back and forth, which to me didn't make sense because um, uh, negotiations just don't work, don't work that way. And we saw with BART as proposals were leaked, sides dug in their heels, and it led to actually to impasse. But what COIN does propose that I really did agree with was one, improving um, advanced information and analysis and provide it to the public prior to the county board considering adoption of any uh, labor negotiations. So we actually put in place uh, and started uh, and applied in this last round of negotiations. One, uh, we went beyond the required Brown Act disclosure um, requirements and, and uh, noticed uh, potential contracts that were going to be coming on the agenda two weeks in advance, maybe was 10 days in, in, in one of the examples. We did a much more thorough analysis and provided that in our staff report and to the public around the cost and the different elements of every uh, contract labor negotiation. And um, I think we had um, more uh, robust discussions, frankly, about not only the process but also the uh, contracts as they came up. So I was not opposed to COIN um, in principle, um, but I was opposed to every element of COIN If I did, in that I didn't know that all of those elements were going to help negotiations necessarily have a better outcome for the public, but certainly the ask for greater public disclosure, transparency, and information so the layperson can understand what these contracts really mean to the public and to the taxpayer were, were well placed and adopted um, by the county. So, so when I, is it the next negotiation? Um, I want to say the bulk of them, I, there's 12 bargaining groups. I think there's at least 12 bargaining groups. Um, the bulk of those we just did, and I think they're, they were three-year contracts, but there's a couple others that will be coming up in the interim who are not on the, on the, on the same that cycle. Time, time cycle, yeah. Anyway, but thank you for the question. And I guess in hindsight, it's a good way to go. I, but that was exactly what I was but thinking. It, but it was not pressing, and I can <laughs> <laughs> Yes? This is related to this in an indirect way, but, um, you know, a lot, I think a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention to the negotiations um, between the county and the work and the, and the public employees, except that they are a public employee. Yeah, sure. But I think that it is becoming more and more relevant in that we're hearing about funding problems and there's not enough money. One of the things that was fully funded for decade after decade after decade after decade 
was the Marin County Public Employee Pension Plan. Mm -hmm. It's not solvent anymore. And for me, I'm, I mean, I just read about this every so often, and I'm thinking for decade after decade, stock market up, stock market down, wars, recessions, whatever, it was fully funded, it was fully solvent. Now it's not. And it was fully solvent not that long ago. Ultimately, it's relevant because at some point, decisions are going to be have to be made. Does Sir Francis Drake Boulevard get paved, or do we pay retirees? But the bigger question, well, maybe you can talk about, at least maybe, how did it get unfunded, given it's all these years of being fully funded, and what are we doing today to get, to get it solvent? Yeah. So good question, and um, over the course of many decades, you're right, fully funded, but probably sometimes dipping under 100%, over, under, over, under. In the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s, was a period um, of multiple years of double-digit returns on the pension fund in terms of, you know, it was forecast for a 7.5% return, I'm not sure if that was the number then, and it was getting double-digit returns. Therefore, it became actually over 100% funded, the, reti the county retirement fund. Um, this was happening across, actually, the state of California. And across the state of California, pressure was brought to bear by labor, by the union groups, to give some of that over-return on investment back to the employees. Because the perception was that the, the public agency was benefiting by this gangbuster economy and stock market, right? So in the early 2000s, Marin County being one of them, but one of the last, counties and jurisdictions across the state actually enhanced benefits. They had, and they had created an enhanced benefit to, tier that provided um, a greater, you know, uh, a lower, I think a lower retirement age and a better benefit in terms of what that retirement rate was. And this was the mistake. I think the, the biggest mistake that was made, they rolled in former em, uh, employee, existing employees who had been hired under contracts that were not as generous into that now more generous tier, if that makes sense. So that meant suddenly there was a bunch of employees that had not been paying in at a certain rate that were going to get a more generous benefit. I mean, it's a, it's, I, I'm really oversimplifying this. So all is good. Pension fund is still fully funded. The actuarials look good if you continue to have these high rates of return, or actually even if you just met the, whatever the 7.5% return was, as long as employees only lived so long and collected whatever, um, and collected their retirement till they passed away. All was good, and then the recession hit. And the recession hit blew out the, um, uh, the county retirement fund as it blew out so many other people's individual savings accounts. Across, across the board. So we went from 100% funded, fully funded, to 76%, maybe it was even lower than that, coming out of the recession. That's, that was the big hit. The, between the retirement and then, add on to that, the fact that act, now we're getting the actuarials are projecting longer lifespan for our employees, correct? So that starts to eat away at the fund. So now we have an unfunded, what's called an unfunded liability. And it's not that we pulled funding away from it. It's that the, the <coughs> base fund that's returning interest, that's supposed to keep, keep it solvent, got hit by the recession, and our actuarial analysis that was done prior is not playing out in real life. Good news is, we're actually paying it down. So we're down to, it wasn't in the low 70s, high 60% funded at, the, at its low point around 2009, 2010. Now we're up at 84%. And that's partly due to returns, increased returns, so stock market cycle. So now we're actually getting the benefit of the stock market recovering. And also we have been investing one-time monies towards paying down that with that unfunded liability, and those are the monies you're talking about that maybe could have gone to roads, but it's a financial decision on the part of the county to all make an investment in paying down this liability, which will be paid down if all stays on track in 15 years, because it actually reduces our overall cost generally and allows us to control our cash flow. Yep, yeah. So, I mean, that's a long-winded answer, but, but it's not, it's, 
it's I struggle with a defined benefit, frankly, solution. If I can add one other thing, and again, we're talking with people in this room, and you can see the ages of the people in this room. One of the things that constantly comes up, almost everybody in the private sector has gone away from the traditional pension plan. Mm -hmm. We are on 401ks. Yep. And the question that comes up is, what's so special about the public employees? Why don't we put them on 401ks? And, and it's a very valid question, and I think it's one of the options and solutions that we have to be looking at going forward, and the county has. We call it a hybrid, where we start. We create a tier where we offer new employees the, the you know an option. Do you want to do 401k? You become more mobile. It has a different kind of benefit or traditional. We don't have the ability without legislative action at the at, in Sacramento to go to a 401 a fully a, a whole 401k type solution. In fact, I think we need to get legislative approval to even do a hybrid. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not as simple. I think uh, the governor signed in that PEPRA a couple of years ago, which actually started to modify how much uh, it reduced the individual jurisdiction's ability to enhance benefits. Actually, it, it pretty much made it impossible to. It, extend, it uh, raised the retirement age, did some different things to help modify the benefit structure to make it more reasonable. But again, a defined benefit is a defined benefit until we get to something it's more, frankly, I would like to see a hybrid that's partly defined benefit, partly defined contribution. County employees don't get Social Security. You need to have, you need, we need to have some sort of baseline for sure, right? Yes. Uh, retirement. But we also, I do think there's something to be said for everyone has to share the risk and the rewards of the stock market and return rates on a pension fund. But it's not simple, and I'm not an economist. Well, this said, didn't just happen in California. If no. you look at the news in Rhode Island and Chicago, Chicago is actually the first place that isn't paying their bills because they've run out of money. Um, and it also, the government accounting rules, which tell you that you're 84% funded now, are actually not accurate. You're not that highly funded. If the, um, if the government accounting rules ever get straightened out so that it really reflects um, what you've got, uh, you're going to find out that it's less than 84% when the current figures tell you it's 84%. Um, I don't know when that's going to hit the fan. But well, and that 84% is actually just a moment in time, too. So Right. But actually, at Gatsby, the government accounting rules they did change over the last few years, and those numbers do reflect whatever our unfunded liability is, and it treats, treats those numbers differently. And again, I'm not an accountant, so I'm, but we actually, um, those have to be reflected in our accounting and I believe in our pension fund uh, unfunded liability assessment, so. Okay, should I let you all go? Do we want to thank some people over here? Yeah, yeah.